morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you for Blue Water Cruising Association for hosting this event. So this is a high level view of what we're going to be talking today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the storage of energy. What is that? Batteries on boats, right? Uh, we're going to be talking about how do you generate power? Where, you know, because it's one thing to have batteries, but you've got to replenish those batteries. And then how do you share power between different devices on your boats? Because we have sometimes multiple battery banks, maybe an engine battery and a house battery bank. And then we're going to talk about monitoring the batteries, like how do you make sure that you have what you think you have. We're going to talk about also distribution. Distribution is also important. Uh, how do you figure, how do you get the power from the batteries out? And then I want to talk a little bit about galvanic uh, protection. And then also as a precursor to tomorrow, the importance about fusing. I've got some videos on fusing and I'm going to be talking about that as well. Okay. Um, The big concept that we're going to be talking a lot, and I'm going to be mentioning this, and there's a, the art of repetition until it sinks in. There's no tests, but there should be, all right? We're going to be talking about this concept here, an unswitched distribution. Notice the battery is right here, and a battery can be made of one or 10 or 20 batteries. I've done a, we did a big boat recently. We had 32 batteries on board. There is no limit other than budget and space on a boat for batteries, right? But in this, conceptual diagram I'm showing a house battery and we're going to be talking about this concept of what's an unswitched distribution and unswitched distribution means everything before the switch meaning it's always on there's always a connection to the battery even when you turn that battery switch off like for example a bilge pump in a boat in your boat no matter if you turn that battery switch off if your boat was wired to code and done properly and that's a big if if right <laughs> as we all know <laughs> it's a big if 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 your boat is wired properly, you're going to actually be able to turn your battery switch off and your bilge pumps should still be working. Your bilge pumps are connected to what's called an unswitched distribution on your boat. And then after that, you have what's called a switch distribution, meaning, let's say, for example, your DC panel. If you turn your battery switch off, your DC panel goes dead. Okay? And so we're going to be talking a lot about that. And this is where things are magical on boats. Like the whole sort of mystery of boating happens because people don't distinguish between unswitched and switch distribution. And that's going to be a big takeaway today is where should my connection go? Is it unswitched or switch? And if you don't care, well, welcome to the world of magic. And it's a scary place. I can tell you, I get phone calls all the time and people are like, it doesn't make sense. I'm like, you're right. It doesn't make sense. And it's not you. It's the electrical system on your boat. You're absolutely right. Your expectations are bang on. Your boat is simply not giving you what normal should be. And so we're gonna actually review every single one of those items one at a time today. And I'm gonna be presenting that picture as we go along, so it's gonna make more and more sense, okay? Um, the previous slide was about DC distribution, direct current. This is alternating current. What we have here in the room is pretty much all alternating current, except for phones. Those are DC, right? They're working off batteries. And we've got an example. I mean, they get com more complicated on a big 80 or 90 or 100 or 150 footer, but up to maybe 60, 70 feet, it's pretty much this. Just maybe more devices, but it's just more of the same. So you've got a shore power cord. You might have a source selector switch. If you have a generator, you might not. Like on my sailboat, I don't have a generator, so I don't have a source selector switch. It powers my panel. And then my panel, if you have an inverter, has a sub-panel. And that sub-panel might be just part of the same panel. You're thinking, oh, it's one. Well, no, it's in the back. The magic is it's separated. And then you're looking at certain items that are basically only run from shore power generator, and then items that might be just or loads that might be running off of inverter or shore power. For example, a hot water tank is not going to be powered by an inverter. You can't. I get that question all the time. It's sort of like you could warm your house with dollar bills or $20 bills, literally putting them as logs in the fireplace. You could do it, but it would not be wise decision and you'd burn through money very quickly. Same thing with creating heat through batteries is a really showstopper. There's no single boat that I've ever seen that actually is able to generate heat from their batteries. Well, they can for an hour or two, you can, but then you have no more batteries. Like you can literally burn money for heat, but then you have no more money. And that's the rate at which you would burn energy 
if you were trying to heat your boat or hot water tank with um, an inverter. But a really good example would be, let's think about a microwave or an AC outlet. How common is it on a boat to have an AC outlet that you can actually plug in? Could be anything, could be your laptop, it could be, uh, I don't know, it could be a Nespresso machine, it could be whatever you want, and have that AC outlet be energized by an inverter, or also powered through a shore power, or generator. So we'll talk about all those. So I'm giving you sort of a little bit of an overview of where we're gonna go today. And at the end of the day, we're going to revisit those diagrams and we're going to revisit them as we go along and it's going to start making more and more sense, okay? Taking away that magic, that's the whole goal, the mystery of electrical systems. All right, with that, we're going to get started with batteries, the heart of your electrical system. Marine batteries come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, basically, that's an image to show you that there's a lot of different batteries out there. There's no such thing as a marine battery. It's like, there's no such thing as a car. We conceptually can visualize what a car is, but there's no a car. It's cars are a collection of different devices that are pretty much similar. And a battery is the same thing. Obviously, they're gonna have a positive and negative. But you can buy a, a battery in four volts. You can buy a battery that is six volts. You can buy a battery that is 12 volts, right? You can buy a battery that is different chemistry. Like in our cars, a lot of cars are gonna have flooded lead acid batteries. Some cars have AGM, some boats have AGM. AGM stands for absorbed glass mat battery. So batteries come in all different sizes and chemistries from all different manufacturers, all built for a different purpose. And what we're gonna be talking about in this first part of the course is let's make sense of all your choices. So an engine battery is used to start the engine uh, or another really good application is running a thruster on a boat, right? A thruster and a starter are very similar. High amount of current draw for a very short period of time, right? So think about in your mind, and I always use batteries are so similar to us people, humans, it's uncanny. And think about a sprinter would be um, a starter battery. So you think about uh, an athlete that does a 100 meter dash and how that athlete can't run a marathon. They're just not one and the same. They're both humans. One is made for speed, i.e. short bursts of energy, right? And able to give a crazy amount of power very, very quickly. And a marathon runner, they're both extreme athletes. The other one is long duration. He's not running for 10 seconds. Now they're doing two hours, two hours and 10 minutes, two hours and five minutes for a marathon. Completely both incredible athletes built for different purpose, okay? So a thruster is another example. Um, starter batteries are never meant to be lift, left in a discharge state. Meaning once you have a big load on a starter battery, you need to worry about how am I gonna replenish that battery. Our cars do that every time. You start your car, as soon as the engine starts, the alternator starts turning, the alternator starts turning, basically produces DC power, DC power goes to your engine battery, and it recharges your engine battery. But if you start your engine and you don't have an alternator working, and you keep doing that, your battery is gonna sulfate. And sulfate is code word for it's gonna die prematurely. All batteries sulfate, what you're trying to do is you're trying to prevent aging, right? You're trying to keep that battery as young as possible for as long as possible. And the other point that's very important, and I can't emphasize this enough, and this is the world of experience, is that batteries are built for a purpose, and you are tempting fate if you try to have a starter battery do a deep cycle application. About six to 12 times a year, I have a phone call from a boater that had a battery explode in their engine room. Generally, it's a new to them boat or a recently purchased boat used. And what happened was someone was inclined to cut costs because starter batteries cost less than deep cycle batteries. And someone noticed that their batteries were dead. And when they came to the battery store, they were given a choice, either buy something for X or buy something for 2x. And in the spirit of saving money, because they're trying to get rid of the boat, and they don't know the choices that they make, because ignorance is bliss, they buy the least expensive battery, and they put it in a deep cycle application. And sure enough, a year or two later, 
you're using a deep you're using a starter battery in a deep cycle application and those are not the same thing remember think about a sprinter and a marathon runner they're not the same athlete at all and that battery will most likely explode in your engine room i've had stories of hatches blowing up off the hinges uh sulfuric acid everywhere in the engine room and an engine room member is a uh, place where there's a lot of metal and sulfuric acid eats through metal so it's a world of hurt it's a pretty sad day it's a very sad day and that's just because someone cut corners they didn't know what they're doing i don't think anybody would intentionally do this right nobody's going ha, ha, you know i'm going to put a poison pill on the boat they just simply don't know because there's so much choice and it's hard you know and so as an owner of a boat i always encourage when i do electrical audits i always encourage owners i say hey make sure your battery is what you think it is you know it, they look the same right that's the hard part they both look the same but the inside is completely different so really emphasize if you have deep cycle batteries on your boat do you right are they is the boat relatively recent to you and who changed those batteries and were you so cost conscious which is a great thing we have to because boats are expensive as we all know they're very expensive to maintain did somebody make a decision that didn't understand the implications of that choice and that's something to think about and for starter batteries you measure their capacity in what are called cold cranking amps right their ability to give amperage for a very short period of time so this is an example of an AD battery a flooded lead acid battery right here okay Rolls is a great company out of Nova Scotia uh, they're literally the Rolls Royce of batteries it's uh, I know it's a coincidence of the name but they're top tier battery deep cycle batteries look at that choice crazy amount of choice so deep cycle batteries are batteries that we use to run lights or water pump uh, even an inverter uh, we're going to use those batteries nav lights stereo navigation equipment you think about it anything outside of running your engine should be on a house battery and those are deep cycle batteries they're meant and i want to emphasize like a marathon runner think about it those batteries are meant you know, they might be discharging, and we'll talk about that later, they might be discharging your batteries for, some people don't recharge their batteries for three days on the hook, right? They get to a destination, and they're going to leave their batteries be discharged for a three-day period, and then they're going to run it. So for three days, that battery is discharging slowly, but for three days. And then after three days, it's going to start getting a charge. And their capacity, and this is very important, um, the unit of measure for deep cycle batteries is something called an amp hour now if it's confusing welcome to the club i remember graduating from university by the way none of this made sense and i did a full engineering degree and i honestly you go through the motions and you're like oh yeah i got it i'm so good and then you own a boat and you're like oh my god oh my god i remember we were boating and i had a friend of mine because i mean obviously you go to school so you make friends in your class he was an electrical engineer and he had a master's and we were completely useless i mean helpless it was pathetic it was so humbling let me tell you the ladies on board were having a blast they're like all oh, this education you guys think you're so smart you can't figure a starter circuit yeah that was a waste of time well the reality is it's humbling for everyone in hindsight you're like wow this is really hard and one of those things that's really hard is this concept of an amp hour like what the hell is an amp hour well, you've got to go back and you've got to think about this concept of an amp. An amp is a little confusing because what we don't realize is it tells us the rate at which something is going. It's similar to speed, like kilometers per hour or gallons per minute. It's flow. It, it, in it is instantaneous. There's no such thing as what is, it's an amp over a period of time is going to give you the distance it travels. So when you think about the word kilometers per hour, think about the word speed. An amp is synonymous with the word speed. If I say to you, for example, I'm going 10 kilometers an hour, how much, how much distance did I travel? Well, the only way to know that is telling you how long I traveled. Because you don't know how, long I tra how far I traveled without the other element, which is time. And so what they do to show the distance, right, the unit of measure that is not over time, but is slowly like a kilogram, a kilometer, whatever it is, is an amp hour. That means at a certain rate, for example, if you're drawing 
uh, a water pump is drawing 10 amps for an hour, you're going to draw 10 amp hours, right? So an amp is really synonymous with speed. And that is, those two words are used interchangeably all the time, although they're completely different units. So think about that when you're thinking about things. Quantity is amp hours. The rate at which you are discharging something in the moment is amps. And batteries are quantified because it has to be. There's no speed in a battery. It's about how much energy does it hold. And that energy is called an amp hour. And you'll see all of this is relevant later. Okay, in case you're thinking of glazing over and falling asleep, I know it's a little bit tedious, but it's definitely worth it. So you're thinking about this and you're saying, okay, when I'm buying uh, lead acid batteries, I really have sort of two choices. Am I going to do traditional, which is a flooded lead acid battery, which is pretty much familiar to all of us. Um, and these are batteries that you have to top off the fluid. But if you drill the hole in the bottom of the battery, the electrolyte would actually leak out, right? It's sulfuric acid inside a battery. And that electrolyte, if you topped it over or you put it sideways, it's like a container or a glass of water. It needs to be upright, right? Because it's a flooded lead acid battery. There's another type of lead acid battery that is very popular, and those are called seal valve regulated batteries. SVR for short, of course, there's acronyms everywhere. And the first of those batteries that was sort of commercially available was what's called a gel battery. And gel batteries um, didn't do too well in the market because they were very particular in their charging uh, rhythms or what their requirements were. And then a replacement for that or another seal valve regulated battery is a battery called an absorbed glass mat battery, an AGM. Boaters are commonly going to refer to AGM batteries as gel. What they mean to say is it's a seal valve regulated battery. And since the first battery to come out that was seal valve was gel, they're using gel as sort of a descriptor for all batteries that are seal valve regulated. Out of 100 motors, maybe one of us is going to have a gel battery. And generally, it's because you have a TRO. And that's it. Other than that, you never encounter a boat with gel batteries anymore. Super rare. They're great batteries, but they're very fussy. So there's no downside to gel other than they're really fussy. AGMs are a little bit more tolerant to undercharge, overcharge, and uh, they're going to be easily, uh, we can replace them. We can actually put them in boats where they had flooded and we don't have to get an external regulator. We'll talk about that. It's less complicated. And hence, most boaters that we deal with, I'd say about 80% in the end end up going with AGM and about 20% have flooded lead acid batteries. And another one, too, now, another variation is the carbon foam AGM, which is the Firefly battery. We'll talk about that as well. So here are the different sort of things you've got to think about when you're thinking about flooded. One is, think about this dollar sign. It's going to be sort of your floor, meaning you can't get a better deal per battery initially than a flooded lead acid battery, no doubt. If price is king and you don't care about life and you don't care about a lot of variables, there's nothing that can beat the low cost of a flooded lead acid battery. The other thing too that's really important is that flooded lead acid batteries, because they can leak, and they will leak, they will sweat at their end of life, and that end of life varies depending on how you abuse the batteries. It could be within two years, one year, it could be up to 10 years if you baby them. They will leak, and if you don't have a battery box, you're in a whole world of hurt because that acid will never evaporate, will never sort of disappear. It's going to be there, just waiting to hit some sort of metal. And I've seen grown men cry. I've seen keelboats on boats where the, two, the last two sets of keelboats were gone because the bilge, it was a dry bilge, and the sulfuric acid made it to the last two keelboats. And the two keelboats were completely vaporized because the sulfuric acid went through them. So. Battery box is very important for flooded lead acid. And you need to maintain them. I have boaters that are very determined. Their way is the right way. And I tell them, if you don't top off your flooded lead acid battery, we're going to see each other a lot more frequently than we need to. And they're like, I don't need to maintain my flooded lead acid battery because that's how I've been doing it. I said, yes, but that's why we see you every second year. I mean, we've got a good relationship, but hey, Maybe every five, six, seven, eight years, you know? It's expensive to change batteries because your time, right? And then you got to go buy them, put them back in, and then your batteries fail. 
So maintenance of distilled water on a flood of lead acid is very important. I was on a boat just recently. The inverter stopped working. So the first call is my inverter's dead. Come in and replace it. Come with a new inverter. Sure enough, we come on the boat. The batteries that were powering the inverter were flooded lead acid battery. The owner didn't even know he had them. Never had maintained them. The batteries were dead dead. They were about seven fifty dollars a piece. There was four. $3,000. That's an ouch. That's got to hurt. I don't care how deep your pockets are. That's got to hurt. Three grand, and that's three grand capital costs. That's not your time to go get the batteries, putting them in, and having us come to the boat with an inverter, realizing that the inverter won't work. It's not because it's an inverter problem. It's a battery problem. And it's not a battery problem. It's because literally you didn't feed the cat. The cat didn't die. You s decided to not feed the cat, right? And then the owner's like sort of embarrassed. And I'm like, well, it's actually not that embarrassing. It happens a lot more than you think. But know where your batteries are. You know, do they need love? And, and, and a big and, by the way, a really big and. It's like every single cell, the one cell that goes takes the whole battery bank down. So if you've got a battery bank where some of the cells are hard to reach and you don't like it, and you're like, well, I got eight out of 10 cells. I mean, this is pretty damn good. I'm close. Well, no, it's actually, you better save your time. Because those two that aren't getting love are going to die. And when they die, they're taking everyone down. It's sort of like a grenade. So you got to maintain every single cell. Every single one of them got to have equal love. And that is a big burden for a lot of boaters. And when Nigel Calder was here recently, a few years ago, he said, flooded lead acid batteries don't die. They get murdered. <laughs> and he's absolutely right. Absolutely 100% right. Now, some of us are super diligent with maintenance. You know, it's religion. It's sort of like you're just doing it ritualistic. You're always going to follow up on your maintenance schedules. Those people don't have flooded lead acid battery can give you good life if you keep up to the contract of maintaining your batteries. And the other point, too, is that they discharge about 15% per month. So, meaning, if you've got about, and this is really big, too, if bulk range, this is huge, huge. I can't emphasize that enough. If you, a flooded lead acid battery has only about a third of its battery capacity that is usable, a third. I have people that say to me and say, wow, Jeff, your battery banks are ridiculous. Why do you exaggerate? I'm like, exaggerate, it's math. There is no exaggeration. Everything is calculated. There is a method to this science. And so if you have a 600 amp hour battery bank, when you're actually using your boat and you're out cruising, you're only gonna be using a third of that battery bank. Meaning you need three times the battery bank that you need with flooded lead acid batteries. That's the ratio. Think about batteries are a little bit like you and I. Our ancestors, you go back 1,000 years, 700 years, I don't think my ancestors had any different DNA than I did. We're pretty much identical. Life expectancy was about 25 years, 30 years if you were lucky. Now why? They had a hard life. They were working. There's no 9 to 5. There's no Monday to Friday. There's no, you're out for survival. You're fighting the fight every day. And if you treat your batteries and they need to do crazy work days, imagine if you had to work 21 hours a day, 7 days a week, you're not going to make it to 80. There's no way. You're going to kill yourself. You'd be crazy. And we ask batteries, we say to batteries, we say, oh, by the way, I really don't care what you need. I'm going to work you so hard. But then when you die, like a horse, when you die too prematurely, I'm going to be really upset at you for not giving me the life that I expect out of you. Life expectancy is a function and a direct function of the depth of discharge of your batteries. There's no other way around it. How deeply you discharge those batteries and the number of times you do it will affect your battery life. So that's super important and that's how you get to 200 amp hours of usable, i.e. a ratio of 1 to 3. So you want 600, you better buy 3 times what you thought you needed originally. And that's why the battery banks for flooded lead acid batteries are really big. On the corollary, that's why lithium battery banks are much smaller because 80% of the battery is usable, right? 80% with lithium is readily usable. And that's why people are spending big bucks on lithium because it's a way to have higher energy density. Okay? So this is an image of a flooded lead acid battery. You can see there's three cells, three posts that you can actually top off. Each cell is about 2.2 volts and that's how you get a six volt battery. 
Gel batteries cost about twice the amount of a flood lead acid battery. Uh, the electrolyte is in a gel state, so it can't leak. You could shoot it with a gun, you could drill in it. It's literally like jello. It's a sealed valve regulated battery. We talked about that earlier. It's no maintenance is required, and that's a big one. A lot of people have a lot of promises in their lives. A lot of problems, that, a lot of promises are also unkept. We do it to ourselves, we do it to our partners, we do it to our children, we do it to our friends, our family. But a battery is an unforgiving creature. She doesn't care what your excuses are. You could have the longest list you want, but it will never care what your excuses are. You have to maintain that contract. And a gel battery, a seal valve regulated battery, does not need to be topped off. Hence why it's really convenient because there is no contract. You put it in and you don't have to give it any love until it dies. It's other than charging. But big caution, and I put that in red, Man, there's stories online before my time of people putting gel batteries and not thinking about the alternator and the battery charger, and after a week, the batteries are dead. And remember, they pay twice the price of a flooded. You can imagine how that, much, that hurts. So they would go to West Marine, go to battery shop, buy the best, put it in, drop replacement. A week later, the battery's completely toast because gel batteries are very susceptible to overcharging. Their charge profile is much less than a flooded lead acid battery. And so that's why it's generally, you never see it. Because it means that you need to have a holistic approach. And a holistic approach on a boat is a pretty big objective. Most people replace things in singular devices and they're not looking at the big picture. So it's just not, it's just not easy for a general boater to put gel in a boat. Uh, notice here, that's really good too, is they discharge only about 2% a month. So, some boaters have uh, their boats on mooring boys or in hangars uh, and they don't have a battery charger. They're not on the boat all the time and they can't charge their, their batteries. Like we did all of DFO's fleet, we change all their batteries, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. We, depart we change all their batteries to flooded because they, their boats were in storage areas, hangars, and they couldn't put them on chargers. And when they would show up to the boat, if they had a flooded lead acid battery, that battery would discharge about 15% a month. Same thing with, think about my folks, they have a place, a little place in Florida, and in the summer, there's someone that drives their car every sort of once a month. If you don't drive your car for six months, like we see in those zombie movies, the car won't start if it hasn't been run in six months. You're not gonna have any battery, it's done. The car's dead. So if you don't use your car for a year, you don't go to your car and say, oh great, I'm gonna start it. The car needs to be started because the battery needs to be topped off because it's a flooded lead acid battery. And that's why people, you see cars in storage areas that have a little solar panel on top of a tarp. They're trying to maintain the battery because nobody's driving their car once a month. <coughs> and here's the reason why people do gel. It's because what you see isn't what you get. It gets 55% of usable battery capacity. Remember flooded was 35. So now what that means is that you only need a 400 amp property bank to give you 200 amp hours. You see how energy density becomes at play? So that's why you can either have more usable capacity with the same batteries or have less batteries and have the same usable capacity. So we'll have boaters that come to me and say, Jeff, I need more power on my boat, but I can only because of physical limitations and we all do, doesn't big, I don't care how big your boat was. I was on a 90 footer two weeks ago. It was jam packed to the rafters. I mean, that boat was packed and you get on a 125 footer, it's packed. You get on a 30 footer, it's packed. You get on a 60 footer, it's packed. Every single boat is packed to the rafters with stuff. And so it's not like, oh yeah, look, I have a room that's completely empty. Let's put stuff on it. No, every boat is packed. And the challenge as boaters is, well, I want more capacity, but where am I going to put that extra capacity? My battery bank is, is, maybe I'll add two, but some can't even add two. They have the space they have for their batteries. And so what you end up doing is you say, okay, I'm going to spend more money for batteries so that I can, with the same amount of batteries, have more usable battery capacity. And it's a trade-off. And people that have lithium do the same thing. They're saying, I have so much little space on my boat that I am willing to pay a huge premium for power because I have no other choice. So that happens as well. And that's the choice that all of us have is how much are you willing to pay more for that space premium? And think about, I always give the analogy and I think about in the city you build high rises, right? In the suburbs you build ranchers, right? Space is not at a premium far, far away from a city. But in the downtown you build high. 
And that high comes with looking at more energy density per footprint, higher batteries, ways to limit the footprint of your battery bank. AGM batteries stand for absorbed glass mat batteries. And this is sort of, there's really two big choices in the marine world right now. And it's either AGM or flooded. Lithium, of course, is a player, but you need to have the money to afford it and you need to be committed. But we definitely do a, a lithium as well. It's just a little bit rarer. And the electrolyte is in a glass mat, so it can't leak, which is great. Uh, very limited gassing. Uh, it's maintenance free. There's no top off, right? There's no maintenance of the battery. You can't add any electrolyte. You don't have to do that, which is great. Self discharge is also very low, like gel, which is what we thought because it's also a seal valve regulated battery. The capacity is similar to gel. It's also 55%. And again, with AGM, you can actually get 55% of the battery is usable capacity. And again, here you could get away with only a 400 amp hour battery bank to get 200 amp hours of usable. That's one of the main differential reasons when I start explaining to boaters their choice and they come to me and they say, Jeff, help me choose a battery bank for my boat. Give me an indication. There's so much choice. I don't know where to go. And I say, well, listen, there's, there are implications. You don't just pay more money for the same thing. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to pay the exact same device for more money. But when we look for cars, we don't shop for a car strictly based on price. We're looking, what are the features I get with that car? It's age, it's whatever, how it drives, is it a sports car, is it a sedan? You're looking at all these different variables and you're going, yeah, that's worth it to me at the price that I'm gonna buy. Same thing we did with our boats. None of us is going out and buying a boat strictly based on price. I mean, otherwise we just shop through Craigslist, sort least expensive and we'd all be looking for the bargain boat and trust me there is no bargain at zero dollars with a boat as we all know <laughs> there are no deals same thing with batteries you got to think about the value really essential so this is an AGM battery really popular line a lifeline um, you'll notice there's no electrolyte to be topped off so Firefly batteries are now three times the price, right? A flooded lead acid battery is $1, and a Firefly battery is going to be three times the price. All the benefits of AGM, which is you know, leak-proof, so you don't need a container, maintenance-free, doesn't vent, and also it gives you faster recharge rates, which is really important for people that are trying to condense their charge time on a boat. This happens with boaters that have fast boats or sailboaters that are trying to sail. But the big thing is it's 12 times the life cycle of flooded. I joke around and I say it's a family heirloom. You'll pull it in your will. It's sort of like, Johnny, you're going to have my batteries on my boat. When I go 20 years, 30 years from now, your sister can have mom's necklace. You'll get the Firefly Bank. Those batteries will outlast most of all our love for a certain boat. 12 times is in the land of the ridiculous. It's like living a thousand years. At one point, you're like, I can go. Like, I don't need to stick around that long. And that's one of the big advantage of the Firefly. The other really big thing um, is this depth of discharge. So with Firefly now, you can go all of the way down to 20% of capacity, like lithium. The difference with lithium is lithium, the top end is also available. From 100 to 20 is lithium. With carbon foam AGM, you go from 85 to 20. And now your 65% of the battery bank is usable. And that's also how you get huge amount of usable capacity in a small footprint. We did a boat where we ended up putting 32 because the owner didn't want to have to worry. It was an 85 footer and they're like, I don't want to worry about power. I'm tired. Running the generator all the time, it drives us crazy. And I want to be able to run from, you know, eight o'clock at night to nine o'clock in the morning, have everything on and not have to worry about it. And we did that before that was impossible with flooded and we didn't add more batteries on the boat. We just changed the batteries to a Firefly battery. Yes, the cost is much higher, but it works. Hope is not a strategy with batteries. Yes, a question. Um, the question is, can you mix and match an old battery with a new battery? And in the past, you wouldn't have done that with AGM or gel because the life cycle was so short that after a year or two years, the batteries would already be in a different stage, right? You know, they're just, they're already so different that it's going to be uneven and you're going to waste a new battery and it's going to be a waste of money. But with Firefly, if the life cycle is 3,600, right, cycles, if you're bringing a battery and you only used it 50, what's 50 on 3,600? It's a rounding error. 
So with Firefly batteries, unless you've cycled them so intensely, some owners are saying, you know what, I'll do X this year, and next year if I only use my boat and I'm only cruising slightly and I'm not cruising every day and I'm bringing my batteries down every day, next year I've only been on the boat for 50 nights, 50 nights on 3600 is inconsequential. So that's where the law of not adding batteries to an existing bank can be changed because the life duration is so ridiculous that you can get away with it, and we do that. So now think about it. Now you only need a 300 amp hour battery bank to do 200 usable of battery capacity. And that's a big deal. So they come in either 12 volts or 4 volts. So when we do the big tall ones, we have to buy them obviously in threes. Or if we go to 24 volts, we buy them in six. Sort of like when you think about a golf cart battery, nobody buys a single golf cart battery. There's no such thing. You can't. It's six volts. You're not going to go somewhere and say, I'm buying a six volt battery. They're like, well, what are you going to run with six volts? Nothing runs at six volts. Right? So you have to always buy a pair and then you wire them in series to make a 12 volt battery. So these batteries here need to be bought in threes and these batteries are 12s and they can be bought in singles. Or if you have a 24 volt bank, like I was doing an electrical survey the other day and the thruster is run on 24 volts. You can't buy a 24 volt battery bank. You buy two 12s, you put them in series or you buy four, four, four sixes and you do 24, but you gotta get yourself to that voltage. So this is an example uh, of six, five, and notice here that's sort of like, that would be called parallel, right? So all the negatives are together, that's all parallel, all the positives are together, right? And then the negative comes on one end and the positive on the other one. So that's six batteries that are about 110, 112 amp hours in parallel for a 660 amp hour battery bank at 12 volts, right? And that's a distinction to remember, people say to me, and I get this all the time, by the way, there's no such thing as a silly question, but people all the time tell me, oh, I've got two golf cart batteries, they're, o they're each 220 amp hours, and I have two on my boat, I have a 440 amp hour battery bank. I'm like, yeah, I wish as well. It'd be great, but you can't add voltage and amp hours, otherwise it's a miracle. And let's be honest, I'm not hoping for miracles a lot in my life, but it ain't gonna happen. And so you can't add voltage and amp hours. If the voltage stays the same, then the amp hours keep adding. But if you start adding the voltages, then the amp hours are going to stay the same. So think about this, like two golf carts in series are going to be 6 volt plus 6 volts equals 12 volts. The amp hours is still a 220 amp hour battery bank, right? Same thing with you had four golf carts in series to make 24. It's a 220 amp hour 24 volt battery bank or battery in this case, not a bank because it's still made of only one battery made of four batteries in a series. So I even see manuals and books actually, believe it or not, I was on a boat just recently uh, in September where the manual actually, the builder was confused. They were actually confused. They were saying that each battery was, they actually had doubled the amp hours capacity on the boat, not realizing that you can't add voltages and amp hours. You've got to choose one. Otherwise, it's pure magic, and there is no such thing. <sighs> All right, so what you've got to ask yourself when you're sizing a battery bank on your boat, you've got to ask yourself, and people, ask, you know, people come to me all the time, they're like, uh, so I need a battery bank, Jeff. How much? I'm like, oh, well, let's go down the rabbit hole together. It's like, how much to remodel a kitchen? Well, it depends. Right? We're going to have to start asking questions. There's not a single solution for every one of us. Otherwise, it would just be a manual. It would be the Bible. Here you go, build your boat according, everyone would do the same thing. But with boats, everything is sort of custom. It's different. So the first thing you've got to ask yourself, you've got to figure out what your daily amp hour requirements are. It's similar a little bit to, I'm thinking about my mother was so good with money. So good. She was so frugal. She was amazing. And she said, well, you're going to go traveling. What is going to spend every day on a trip? What's your, daily, what's your daily budget, you know, when you travel? What is it? We're going to go to New York, you know, together. I was born on the East Coast. How much is it going to cost us? How much money do we need to bring before ATMs and stuff like that? And so you go, okay, you do the math, and you're like, I'm going to need $200 a day, $100 a day. Backpikers do it, you know, out of college, you know, $30 a day. Whatever your number is, you've got to come out with what is going to be your daily amp hour budget. It's essential. You cannot size a battery bank without knowing what you need. It's like sizing your retirement and not knowing what your burn rate is. Do you need a million dollars in the bank? You need 10 million or you need nothing? What's your burn rate? It's got to be something. 
And you got to know what your yearly burn rate is to figure out how much money you need to save for retirement. And batteries are very similar to that. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that people come to me, and this I would say is 90% of the boaters come to me and say, Jeff, I really use no power. I'm super frugal. I don't have, I don't have any power needs. I'm like, oddly enough, everyone says that, yet I'm in the business of delivering power. So let's walk back and let's figure out how is it possible that nobody needs power, yet that's the very thing that I'm sort of driven at solving. And what people don't take into consideration is the loads of a refrigerator on your boat. The moment you take away a refrigerator in your boat, it's sort of like being mortgage free. If you're mortgage free, you are rich. Absolutely, congratulations, a lot of envy. Super aspirations to get there one day. But if you love fresh food and cold food and cold beverages, you have a mortgage on your boat. And I'm talking about a mortgage without any down. I'm talking full payment. I'm talking it's gonna be 80% of your income. Welcome to the world of hurt, okay? There is no shortcuts. Refrigeration is the largest number one draw until your boat is basically probably around to an 80, 90 footer and you're running generators all the time. But up to that point, refrigeration is number one load on a boat. And the bigger the boat, the more refrigeration they have. They have one on the aft deck, they want to have on the flybridge, they have a deep freeze down below, they have double door fridges, and you can have a sailboater like I am and a 30 footer and you have only, then you've got a big hunter, a 50 footer. You got two fridges, you know, like the fridges just simply are growing exponentially as a function of your size. And so refrigeration is the largest load on a boat. And if you think you're a Luddite, if you have any refrigeration on your boat, unfortunately, you might be a Luddite in your everyday spending. I, you don't buy coffees, you don't go out for dinners, you turn the lights off all the time. But if you have a mortgage, you ain't rich. Not in a place like Vancouver. You can't be. You just can't. And so refrigeration is going to be a huge part of your daily amp hour needs. I'm giving you numbers here to sort of imagine what is your burn rate on typical boats? You know, is it 85 amp hours a day? Is it 375? Is it 500? You know, I've got some boats that are 1,000 amp hours a day. There's no limit, of course, you know. But if you don't have a battery monitor on your boat, it's very hard for you to know that. So one way is to ask someone like myself, hey Jeff, I've got this boat, here's what I have, and I'll be able to guess it, just because, you know, experience. Sort of like a good golfer knows what club to take, depending where they are, right? I have no clue what I'm doing at golf, so my dad always tells me, no, no, you, you can't do that right now. No, you gotta take this club, right? Same thing with amp hours. Now, if you have an, a battery monitor on your boat, as everyone should, definitely should, you're gonna be able to actually know what your burn rate is because you start your day at noon and 12 hours, 24 hours later, if you didn't run the engine or have solar or any recharge, you'll be able to know like, yeah, on a typical day, I burn 100 amp hours. So on a typical day, I burn 200 amp hours. Where it gets a little bit complicated is that your burn rate in the summer is different than the winter because the lights are longer in the winter, you're running heat in the winter. Heat comes from diesel, but the distribution of that heat is gonna come from batteries, right? So you got to know what's my number and that's, you see that with people who are going offshore. I was looking at a spreadsheet the other day. What are my amp hours at a destination and what are my amp hours while underway? Two different numbers. You're not using an autopilot at a destination, but you're maybe going to be using an autopilot if you don't have a wind vane underway. You're going to be using your radar potentially 12 hours a day. Are you going to be using your radar at a destination or an anchorage? Probably not. So the numbers are different for people that go offshore underway or at destination and here in BC or for a cruiser your power consumption in the summer and in the winter is going to be different so depending if you only boat in the summer then only care about the number in the summer but if you boat in the shoulder season and or the winter then you have to start considering oh, okay yeah well I'm going to draw more power in the winter because the lights are going to be on longer the heat is going to be on right those are factors that come to play <clears throat> 